discuss first of all the principles of software engineering. What is that field? Where does it get its name from and what does it include? We will describe very briefly the software engineering activities which are covered by this name. There are measures which <coughs> actually indicate the maturity of the process that you follow in software engineering. The most important measure is called the Capability Maturity Model Measure or CMM levels as described by the Software Engineering Institute. We will briefly discuss what those models, what those levels are and what they imply. We will do a very quick review of ER model because that forms the crux of modeling the static characteristics of data that you handle. We will then discuss the functional model which is called the data flow model. In the data flow model, not only we describe how data flows between different processing modules that we have envisaged and how exactly processing of that data occurs. This is a model which, is, which has a, a pictorial representation just like ER model and that is called the data flow diagram or DFDs. These are classical analysis technique. Today in the field you will actually find people using what we call object oriented analysis and design methodology. Subsequently we will have a lecture by uh, my colleague Professor Umesh Belur where he will explain to you the fundamentals of OO modeling. However, since you have to represent your entities and data and since you have to represent processing, the fundamentals are same whether you represent them in this model or that model. The O model differs mainly in that the terminology and conceptual framework that it uses is beneficial when you are implementing the solution finally in an object oriented programming language such as Java etc. However, the fundamentals will still remain the same as I mentioned. We will very briefly discuss user interface issues so that you get an idea of what to capture during systems analysis phase. We shall have larger discussion on these issues at a later time. And finally, as I said, we will discuss the software requirement specifications, which is actually a formal document which needs to be prepared at the end of first phase of gathering the requirements of functionality from the end users. It is only on the basis of this document that software design will be done later, and it is on the basis of that software design document the actual coding, etc. will happen. So this is the formal process like any other engineering process. In fact, that's the reason why the whole thing is called software engineering. There is just a quick review of some fundamentals which we already understand. In modern computerized world, the business functionality depends mainly on software. So in which way you can register for your courses easily or with difficulty, whether all validation rules are followed or not, etc. is defined by software. Consequently, software for application becomes extremely important. You do require good system software because that forms the basis of any application software. If you recall, we said operating system, programming languages, other tools, etc. are the or database management system which itself is a uh, system software of some kind. So all these things together will form the basis on which you will write application software. You are not going to write application software, you are at still higher level, but defining what functionality that application software should give. But in order to define the requirements and in order to design the system, should generally be aware of what technology components are going to be ultimately used to implement that system. You require tools to build software which keep evolving. For example, we discussed 4GS. Fourth generation language is called a specification language. You don't prescribe algorithms, etc. SQL, as you already know, is a 4GL language. But there are other tools. For example, tools which are called RAD tools. RAD stands for Rapid Application Development. So anything which permits you to develop application more rapidly than using any other older technology is called a RAD tool. For example, when Fortran, COBOL, Pascal, C, etc. programming languages were developed, these are called 3GL tools. In the era in which these things first came, these all were rapid application development tools. So otherwise, you have to program in the machine language or assembly language. When SQL came, SQL was regarded as a rapid application development. Something else which is now available, which is actually called code generators. That means you write the specifications in such a form, either using a formal language or using some formal modeling tool, 
and the tool itself is able to create Java programs, able to create C programs, whatever you want. So these are all rapid application development tools. So for PLCs, uh, the code generator is uh, could we call it a code generator? Uh, so for PLC, we uh, programmable controllers. Programmable logic controllers. <laughs> you are talking about hardware. No, then huh. we, we uh, specify we, or we define the control ethics in either in function block diagram or ladder logic. Yes. And then uh, there is a code generator. Correct. So, so code generator is a rapid application development tool for that specific application. Certainly. See, this is, a, this is a problem with terminology. What is rapid today was actually very slow just five years ago. And what was very rapid five years ago was extremely slow ten years ago. No, just, I, I raise this point because this, is, uh, this technology is very old. No, this is there. I will tell you the still older technology. When I was doing my master's, we had to design a flip-flop using 4 and, uh, 2 and 4 not 4 transistors. So you have to actually design what is the resistance that you will put between collector and emitter and so on. When I first constructed a flip-flop, after 10 days of design and 2 days of actual uh, uh, soldering, the damn thing will either flip or flop. <laughs> and that is because we figured out that the HFE which I had measured, the, the equipment measuring the HFE was showing incorrect HFE for two years, which I didn't know. So these were the things that people today will laugh at it. In fact, I don't think people today, electronic engineers, can actually design a flip-flop. Because they not only get flip-flop ready-made, they get decayed counters ready-made, they get a variety of other circuits ready-made. They get the whole goddamn computer on a chip ready-made. So these things will continuously happen. And that is why the notion of rapid, which is sensitive to time. Today what is rapid was not rapid earlier is all that I mean. And what is rapid today will appear as a very slow process five years down the line. So ultimate is, you know, when something like God said, let there be light and there was light. You know, that is the fastest. We have to approach the level of the gods someday. Anyway, we digress, so let's come back to this. Typical life cycle of an application software is somewhere between 10 to 15 years. Now, this is something you must understand and appreciate. No software, first of all, remains static even for these 15 years. You take six months or one year to develop some software. By the time you complete the development, the end user will say, no, this thing is to be done this way, that thing is to be done this way, this additional information is required to be handled, etc. Consequently, throughout the life cycle, software will keep changing because the functionality requirement is changing. These changes have to be adapted in the software by what we call software maintenance activity. Maintenance is a term routinely used in engineering to just maintain the existing functionality of a machine. That is not true in case of software. Software maintenance, in fact, requires all the skills of new software development because you are actually adding functionality. Worse, you are adding functionality to a piece of software about which you may not know anything at all because somebody else has designed and written it. So software maintenance in the software activity is the most difficult part, sometimes more difficult than originally designing and writing. Now, since the software evolves, and I might maintain some software for two years, I may go somewhere else, somebody else will come and maintain that. Maintenance means what? I am basically writing new lines of code to include new functionality. I will have my own style, somebody else will have a different style. Consequently, in 15 years, why is the life only 15 years? In, in 15 years, the shape of the software is such that it is not easily maintainable beyond that. A machine or a car can run for 30 years. A bicycle can run for 50 years. An old uh, wall clock can run for 50 years. Software can also run for 50 years, but it will have two problems. One is, it will do exactly what it was doing 50 years ago, which you don't want anymore. So the life cycle of software is 10 to 15 years, not because the software stops working, but because the functionality that you require cannot be delivered by that software unless you add to it and adding some software to a system which has been maintained by 50, for 15 years is very difficult. In fact, it is much easier later to rewrite the whole damn thing starting from scratch. So that's the reason why the software life cycle is typically 10 to 15 years. Okay. And in these 15 years, software keeps undergoing changes as I mentioned through and through. What are the characteristics of software? 
software is developed or engineered it is not manufactured unless it is what we call a shrink wrap product a operating system a word processor these are called shrink wrap products because one software once it is built millions of people use exactly the same software that is because somebody has had the mindset to examine the common functionality that everybody requires put that functionality into software give that software a name like microsoft office or open office or whatever or linux operating system or whatever and release that office then millions of copies can be produced but that production is hardly any production it is copy and put it in a cd burn it and package it and send it the manufacturing cost so to say which is strictly only for making multiple copies of the software is trivial the real cost is in developing that software so barring such shrink wrap products most of the software and including the original of the shrink wrap product also needs to be developed or engineered is a very fundamental difference from other things second the software does not wear out i just mentioned it software will continue to run perpetually if you are happy with whatever functionality that software was provide but if you want a different functionality or if the software is not easy to maintain then you need to change it hardware however does we are out and that's another problem that modern software faces if you have written a software to run on a particular hardware and if the hardware goes out of date which means the underlying operating system the underlying tools the underlying processors memory disk all those undergo changes then you may have a serious problem that's the reason why you have addition of abstraction layers so if a new hardware comes for example but it is guaranteed that your unix or microsoft windows operating system will run on it it is guaranteed that oracle or any other database will run on it it is guaranteed that your java or c++ compilers will work exactly the same way then the entire software is called portable software because you can port it across to the new hardware <coughs> so fundamental fact software does not wear out but hardware does wear out most software is custom built as i said there is a limited role for packaged products and barring the packaged products which are called shrink wrap products shrink and wrap are the english word shrinking is you know you shrink them into a cd and package them and wrapping wrap is putting some nice color microsoft windows 2003 or some such thing and and selling those so except for such applications you require either custom built software or even if you have package software you might have heard of package software called erp packages enterprise resource planning packages okay or uh, human resource management packages such as cbel or accounting packages most of these will require customization for each individual organization so software development is a process which requires people who can write software and those people need to spend time that is the time which you measure as person months more person months are required if the functionality is very complex and or the tools which these people use are very low level <coughs> say somebody has to write programs in cobol or c or something they will take longer somebody has to write programs in sql they will take shorter if somebody has a code generator where you just put the model and it generates the code and you just have to test it it will take less time but the fact of life is that software is developed or engineered and therefore you require people more the world goes towards systems which are automated more software is required and therefore more people are required now you can understand why india has emerged as a talent pool for developing software for the rest of the world and that is because the world demands more and more functions to be automated this process is unlikely to slow down over the next two decades at least so for next two decades it is guaranteed that more and more people will be required to write programs to give you an example of what would happen if the tools for rapid application development are not there well it was estimated about 20 years ago when cobol programming was the only thing for business applications that we discussed the prediction was that in 25 years then that means around this time now 
the prediction was that if programs continue to be written in COBOL and continue to be maintained in COBOL, then the number of people required in United States to write those COBOL programs 25 years later will exceed the total population of United States. That was the prediction. That means every American would be writing COBOL programs for someone else. Who is writing COBOL programs for someone else, etc. Stupid situation. Okay. So, the reason why the globe can actually use a very small percentage of people to write programs is because these tools are developed. And still there is a tremendous pressure because the functionality requirements are increasing day by day. With this background, we come to the notion of software engineering. All of you are engineers or applied scientists, so you should know what engineering is. This is an IEEE definition of 1993. Application of a systematic, disciplined and quantifiable approach to development, operation and maintenance of software. That is, application of engineering to software. Because this is what engineering is all about. Application of systematic, disciplined and quantifiable approach. If your approach to problem solution is systematic, that means there is a definition. Discipline, that means everybody follows that definition. Notice that on a shop floor, if somebody is, let's say, machining certain parts for a larger thing like an automobile, that fellow is not permitted the luxury of saying, I might put this here or that here. That person is required to produce exactly as per specification within the permitted tolerances. Otherwise, that part is useless. That, that is called discipline. The people who actually write code have to follow the discipline of exactly implementing what is there in the design doc, etc., etc. That is application of engineering. Engineering itself is the analysis, design, construction, verification and management of technical or social entities. I don't know whether you have heard the term social engineering. In fact, the word engineering is applied to represent these attributes of the activity. So, analysis, design, construction, verification and management. You agree? These are the, these are the activities that you have to understand. Consequently, if you are talking about software engineering, it must follow exactly the same thing. And therefore, we must define a development process. How will you, you have to do analysis first, then you have to do design, then you have to construct that software, then you have to verify whether the software works or not, and then you have to manage that software during its life cycle of operations. And there is an iteration because the moment you have to maintain it, for example, somebody says, change this functionality. The easiest way in your own case when you write programs and your guide or somebody says, no, I want this additional functionality. What do you do? You simply add some more lines of code directly. In an engineering methodology, you can't do that. But the original code that you have written has been written only after there was a design document. And the design document came out only after there was a functional specification or analysis document. So if some change has to be made, in an engineering principle, you have to go back to the original, saying this is the new functionality. Then you have to do an impact analysis. How does this functionality impact the other parts? Introduce the modified design. And then as per that design, you have to actually write the new code. And after writing that new code, you have to test the entire software again in exactly the same rigorous way that you tested somewhere else. Just to give you an example, in a banking software, if some requests come for making some changes in interest calculation or something like that, they will appear to be trivial changes. They can be done in a single day by writing 10 lines of code somewhere. But to figure out which 10 lines to change and then to figure out these 10 lines impact what other portions of software and then to rigorously test them is a huge process. No banking software modification is released without one and a half months of rigorous quality assurance or testing, no matter whether the changes made are small or big. And there are generally teams of 40 to 50 QA engineers working on just rigorous testing. So that, that's the kind of protocol that you have to follow for engineering. Otherwise imagine, I mean, any engineering artifact, you say bicycle. So somebody says, okay, change the functionality of the bicycle and automatically changes the way the chain works between something and whatever, whatever, and releases 500 bicycles. And they don't work. What will happen? So that's why, that's what exactly we mean by saying, applying the engineering to software. How do you build information systems in the engineering context? First, you must come up with functional specification. 
The next phase in building information systems is actually called systems engineering. It's very difficult to expose you to the notion of systems engineering in a course like this because this involves feasibility study. What will you seek from a feasibility study? Somebody gives you a functional definition. This is, this is the functionality I want. The feasibility study will say, is it feasible to build software to do this? Second, it will say how long it will take some rough estimates of time and cost. Imagine that I want a functionality for a limited immediate application and I must have that functionality in three months. And if you come up with a software analysis and later on design and code and everything and it takes one year to complete, then it's an infeasible proposition. You must immediately say that in this time period I cannot deliver this. Or suppose there is a small business uh, fellow whose annual turnover is say 20 lakh rupees and he says I want this software for enterprise resource management package and so on, will you develop it? I don't mind waiting for one year or two years. Uh, you put 500 people and you develop the best software in two years and say yes, now I have developed this software, pay me 18 crore rupees. Uh, that, that fellow will go bankrupt, he can't do that. So, therefore, this basic feasibility must be ascertained right at the beginning. Won't you agree that it's a very fundamental engineering requirement of undertaking any venture? So, that is what we mean by system engineering. In this phase, you also allocate different functionality to hardware, software and people. What do we mean? Consider you are automating a weighing scale for trucks. You know, trucks move on the roads. So you have to weigh them because they have to pay some duties or whatever, whatever, whatever. Now, you may decide on an automated process where the trucks will just go to a diversion. You would have seen those in the roads, okay? Trucks go through something. There is a weighing scale. They stand on it. In the worst case, some manual person notes some reading. In a more automated case, the reading is automatically generated, electronically passed on to a computer and invoice is printed. Now, in the second case, you are allocating more functions to the embedded hardware. The weighing machine has embedded hardware, embedded software in that hardware which automatically will calculate these values, transmit them, etc. Even for embedded hardware, you may need some software function. But the basic objective of weighing will not be done by software. It will be done by some kind of a scale. So, while such functionality is described to you, you must start assigning this job will be done by hardware, this job will be done by other gadgets, this job will be done by software and yet there will be some job which will have to be done by people. For example, people might actually tear off that invoice and give it to that fellow, maintain an additional paper record or call up someone if a truck just runs away, whatever. So, there will be functionality assigned to people, hardware and software. This part has to be done as part of systems engineering. The next phase is the systems analysis phase where you gather all the functional requirements about the proposed system. And this is the phase that we are going to concentrate on in this session. After you have prepared, after you have completed the analysis, the end of analysis is a formal document as I described called system requirement specification document. By the way, for meaningful systems, the software requirement specification document typically runs anywhere between 100 pages to 5000 pages. And there is not a single line of Java code or C code or SQL code or anything, anything in that document. That is the rigor with which system requirement specifications must be defined. That is the rigor with which you will define such specifications for any engineering activity. Now that is something which we don't traditionally do for software which is made by individuals amongst us for a quick assignment or something. Have you ever written a system requirement specification document for any program that you have written? Never. So this is a new activity as far as you are concerned. But this is what a professional software must precede or must be preceded by. Without this document there is no sanctity for any professional software product. The system design is one where you actually do what is known as a software architecture design first and then you go ahead and do module level design. So let's say in your software ultimately during the design you decide 
that the architecture will look like this, these will be so many programs, this program will call this, that program will call this, etc. And let's say there are 500 program units that you decide on. Each of those 500 program units will have to be described in terms of the algorithm that the program will have to execute, the data structure that will be used, the other calling program parameters, everything. Again, no coding, no Java, no C++ at this stage. And if the software requirement specification document is, let's say, 300 pages, it is not uncommon to have almost 500 to 700 pages of the design document for that. You get the point? That is what a rigorous engineering process is. After this, you start coding. Not a single line of program is ever written in this process till the software design document is ready. You might write some lines of code as an experiment or prototype as we shall see later. But none of that code will ultimately go into the final system. The actual coding starts only after the design document is ready, not till then. Observe that in all your experience when you wrote software, whether you wrote simple programs for your assignments or you wrote larger programs for your MTech projects or PhD projects, you never did these steps. That's a fallacy that needs to be corrected. However, going forward, that's something that needs to be done for any non-trivial software which you will require in your organization or which you are in charge of producing for some other organization. Observe that these steps up to system design do not really require you to be a programmer at all. So any person from any field who understands information science who understands the basic underlying technology and who understands the methodology of software design can actually do this. That is one of the reasons why in the entire world the profession of software engineers is filled up by people from variety of fields because actual programming knowledge is not required. Although traditionally people have been taught some programming and they become programmers first and then they become analysts or designers. But that is not essential at all. Coding is one activity, testing the code as I mentioned is another activity and integration of different modules, much like engineering system. So you make 10,000 parts, but all of them have to be assembled and put together so that the motor car will run finally. Okay, now that job is assembling. And after integration, there is something called integration testing. You have to test the final product. Now let's say you have been given the task of developing an information system, let's say grade processing system for IIT or accounting system or whatever and you have gone through all these phases and let's say I have given you that task. Now when you come back to me saying this is your software, I have tested it. It is my responsibility to test that software. That testing is called user acceptance testing. So I think the testing the, uh, when you are submitting a document, document has to be also tested before going for coding. Yes. Like that, that is not called testing. That is called document review. We shall see that when we discuss the document thing. Yes. Testing is word applied to actual code testing and functionality testing. So what is the difference between this testing and the acceptance testing or user acceptance testing? User acceptance testing typically stresses the functionality. I wanted this function to work like this, 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 whether your software does that or not. I have stipulated in my requirement specification that interest on a bank loan of this type should be calculated like this, interest on some other type of long term loan should be calculated like this, whether your system calculates it or not. You would say that you have tested this thing precisely, but there ends your responsibility. To me as an end user, the responsibility only begins, because if I accept your software, and sign off and say, yes, your software is okay by me. That amounts to saying that I have tested all the functionality that I require you to do. And later on if there is a problem, you will tell me that you have to pay me more money to even look at that problem. So there is a testing by the supplier, there is a testing by the end user. It's very much like you buy a TV. The TV manufacturer would have tested that TV. But when the TV is installed in your home, you definitely want to check whether it switches on when you place the thing, whether the remote works, whether the various screens come, various formats, etc. You do check, right? That is nothing but user acceptance testing. In case of TV or such other engineering products, it is trivial. In case of software, it is very rigorous. That is why 
even take for example banks, insurance companies or other trading companies or whatever who maintain the IT systems which are developed by outsiders like TCS, Wipro or whatever. These organizations within themselves have large information technology teams and much of the time they are doing this quality assurance or user acceptance testing. In fact, now there are companies which specialize in doing user acceptance testing on your behalf. So let's say you have got a requirement specification and you have decided that Tata Consultancy Services will develop that software. You have given all the specifications. Incidentally, when you do a system requirement specification document, at that time you have to specify how will you do the user acceptance phase. You have given that and Tata Consultancy Services have delivered the product after six months. Now you do not have internal capability to test the software from a user perspective. So you hire another company which, is, which say we specialize in testing and they will send their people, they will understand your user requirement specification, they will prepare test cases and they will execute those test cases and certify to you that yes, this meets your functional requirement. So you can see a very large activity and a large number of people who are required for doing this. What is the process through which all these steps are taken? The first and the simplest to understand is a linear sequential model which is also called the waterfall model. A waterfall is not water is coming there and falling in one shop. But consider that there is a staircase and the water is falling there. So water will first come at the top, fall onto the next stair. It will fill it up, fall onto the next and next. So step by step. This linear model is a process where you say that first you do requirement specification. That is systems analysis. Only after the entire system analysis is complete, you then do design. Only after the design is complete, you do coding. Only after the total coding is over, you do testing. And finally, you say user acceptance test. Unfortunately, the linear model or the waterfall model is not considered good because after I have told you my requirements, usually one year later, I will get to see the software. And when I see the software, I will say, no, this is not what I meant. And you will point out, no, this is what you have written. The problem starts because the English language is often inadequate to describe my requirement correctly to you. I myself might not have understood that requirement correctly. Apart from the fact that my requirements should undergo a genuine change in the one year, the very fact that I cannot convey the requirements well, or you did not understand my requirement well, could cause a lot of problems. That is why while this model is the sturdiest model, it is not considered useful model for real life applications. Consequently, you have a prototyping model. In the prototyping model, you take the major business processes and data and quickly construct a prototype. This is where those rapid application development tools are useful. In this prototype, you show to the end user that this is how your screens will look, this is how your report will look, this is how the data fields will come, etc. It is very impressive to see the statistics of how the users who are given you certain requirements themselves modify those requirements and the wording of those requirements when you show them that these are how things will work. They say, no, this is not what we meant, this is what we want, etc. If the prototype can be put in place very quickly, say in about two months' time, then at the end of two months, you have refined user requirements which both you understand better and the user understands better. You may then follow the linear model. So this prototyping model is, it says model the business data and processes, generate the application quickly, test and turn over. Turn over means show it to the user, but now you want to put a rigorous system in place. If your prototyping itself has followed good practices, you may be able to use part at least of the design. But you may decide to revamp the whole design and do a perfect design for an industry grade software layer. So usually a prototyping model involves early prototyping and either following a linear model from that point again or revising the prototype again and again which results in other model which we shall see later. Rapid application development I already mentioned. So you do almost codeless programming. But evolutionary model. These models have become more popular of late. One is called incremental model. 
So sequential plus prototyping means in a way. You do a prototype and then you say, okay, you modify this, you follow linear model for some time, then again you do some prototyping at some place. The spiral, spiral model is most popular. You know where spiral goes, right? It starts from one point, makes a circle that goes somewhere else, another circle and it grows. The spiral model in software development will mean that I will do either quick prototyping or quick uh, linear model following to one cycle. And once it is there, any modification that is required now is absorbed and you again do analysis, design, code generation, etc. Keep doing that and if the software then spirals. So spiral model is considered very useful for longevity of the software because you have followed rigorous processes. You have a variety of other models. There is one called concurrent development model. There are formal methods model. I will not go into the details of these because this is not part and parcel of our course material here. What are the umbrella activities which form part of the software engineering process? First of all, project tracking and control. All of you are familiar with project management? Not formally perhaps. If four of you are doing a project, how do you manage the project? What does management mean? How do you ensure that the project is completed successfully in six months of stipulated time? Distribution and tracking and control. So you do distribute and you say this is my weekly timeline. And at the end of week you find nothing has been done. If you don't have a tracking mechanism, you won't even know. Till four months are over and you find that Absolutely nothing else. So project tracking is part of the software project management. Control. If nothing has been done, you shout, shout, shout at two or three people saying, now run faster and catch up. Okay. The fundamentals of project management. Formal technical reviews. You asked about the document. Any document which is produced must be reviewed. And it must be reviewed by somebody other than the one who wrote it. Now you will understand why software engineering has to be a team effort like any other engine. So in a team of say 9 or 10 or 11 people, uh, if you have three groups, one group writes specifications for something, that document must be reviewed by another group. Without, the, uh, without this review, where you check everything from English language mistakes in a plain requirement specification document to completeness of functionality etc etc. Two, if you are doing a code document, you see, SRS is written first, then there is a design document. When you write the code, there is a code document, the actual code. If I write some code, say Java program, this Java program must also be read by someone else. Read, not just machine reading and executing. It must be read by someone else. This is called code review or code walkthrough where people look at my code and say whether I follow standards or not, whether my algorithm looks okay or not, whether I miss something. So it's a very, very rigorous process. That is why it's called engineering. Consequently, the software that we write would be termed as amateur software. It still works. The software may not be amateurish, but the process is not an engineering process. And that is the difference. Software quality assurance. QA is a very, very important step in any engineering. Here also it is important. Unfortunately, the word testing or QA is not considered to represent an individual with a very high status or stature. So in, in the software business, people are generally uh, reluctant to participate in QA or testing activity. But you will understand that this activity is as important as coding, or as important as any other system analysis or design activities. Configuration management. This is, a, this is an important item when you are talking about large software. A large software would typically have hundreds of modules. And these modules may be independently maintained. So one module is version 3.4, another module is version 2.1, a third module is version 1.13. 4, 5, 6, 7, module around 11.1, whatever. Now you are saying that this product, which is the version 2 of my total application, say accounting application, comprises of this version of this module, this version of this module, this version of this module, this version. 
in the next release of that version 2 of my software which I call 2.1 5 of these modules might have migrated to a new version some other module I might have gone back to the previous version because this had bugs the new module might have come up this is called configuration of the overall software configuration management is a big thing you might also have one particular configuration for State Bank of India another configuration for Bank of Baroda a third configuration for something else managing that and maintaining these releases and versions is a very very important activity in large and complex software document production SRS document I said that the SRS document will undergo a change if some change is requested by somebody later how will you actually manage that document you have let's say produce an SRS document for the project that you will do here you will review it, you will finalize it, you will print it in whatever format and you will give it a date say you produce that document on uh, 13th March 2008 now we continue to use that software which is so generated and within the year there are three modifications which are required there are new functionalities which are introduced how will you reflect that into a new document called system requirement specification document new how will you say that will you insert paragraphs or pages in the original document if you have made 20 copies of the original document how do you make sure that the recipients of all 20 copies actually have the same paragraph change, additional pages, etc, etc. How do you make sure that you distributed 20 copies but 5 of my colleagues have made another 10 copies each and distributed to someone else? In short, how do you maintain the updated version of a document relentlessly across all possible readers at all possible times? It's not a trivial exercise. You agree? It's not a trivial exercise because software undergoes changes, documents will change and producing those documents, releasing those documents, making sure that all recipients have the right version of the document itself is one of the activities that must be considered under the umbrella of software development. Reusability management. This applies to large software houses. Consider Tata Consultancy Services who have developed some application software for Bank of America in New York. There is another project which TCS is undertaking for, let's say, a Deutsche Bank in Germany. You will agree that many of the functionalities could be very common because both are banks. So why should that team working on Deutsche Bank should rewrite everything else if it has certain libraries or functions which are already part of this? The reason object-oriented analysis and design methodologies are more popular is because object libraries are more easily reusable than functions or subroutine libraries that you write for specific thing. Reusability significantly reduces cost and development of software if you already have some software ready. Uh, it's not different from copying an assignment from someone. We are reusing you know, somebody else's assignment. So in software also the same thing. Another important activity in software engineering is measurement and risk management. What is the risk of delays? What is the risk of errors? How many errors could be permitted in software? What is the impact of one error? How will you make software completely error free or bug free? By thorough testing can you do that? The answer is no. Thorough testing does not guarantee that the software has no error. Thorough testing guarantees that you have not been able to find an error in the software. Please understand the significant difference between these two statements. The most thorough testing, you write a simple program, which is let's say 200 lines program, it has a lot of if statements and iterations. You can actually draw a graph representing branches at every if, do loop iterations, etc, etc. And suppose you have to do a testing which will test every path will all, with all possible values of the variables which that path can be traversed with and to ensure that you still get correct answers. The number of exhaustive tests that you will require will be close to infinity. 
You can write a 200 line program in 5 days and you can spend 5 years in testing it exhaustive. Consider simply all possible integer numbers that a variable can take. You want to test whether it works for n equal to minus whatever uh, 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 2 raised to power uh, 32 to 2 raised to power 31 or whatever. For each value and for each combination of values of all variables. That is what is exhaustive testing. You can't do that. So there are testing methodologies which test of what you call borderline. Where the certain combination can create a problem you want to test it. Simple example, you test whether numbers can be added. You test it with two numbers, three numbers, four numbers. At a certain point where each individual number is within the representation capability of the programming language or computer, but the sum total is not, you will have an overflow. So these are the kind of problems that are associated with testing and therefore you need to do some statistical measurements for risk or the statistical measurement of what is the impact of errors in your software. It's another huge topic by itself. We are not going to cover any one of these by the way. I thought I will just mention these so you understand that software engineering is not just, in fact it's basic software engineering is not just writing programs. You have requirement specification phase, analysis phase, design phase, coding, testing, acceptance testing and management. But even other than that, all of these activities constitute part of software engineering. So it's a, it's a vast field really. <coughs> software project management requires basic project management like in any other project. It requires formulation of software teams and the biggest challenge is coordination and communication. These facts were understood only over a period of time as software evolved to become a juggernaut. Earlier when people used to have machines and they used to write small programs in machine code, the notion of software project management did not evolve. Because an individual was constructing a program and that individual used to be almost like an artist. When large programs were required, and how do you measure the programs? You measure them by size. The size is measured by what we call lines of code. 10 lines of code, 100 lines of code, 1000 lines of code, 50,000 lines of code. Anybody written a program for 50,000 lines of code? Non-trivial. The Aeronautical Development Agency project which our programmers have been doing, the pro programs have been evolving, we have kept that software live for almost 15 years now. The size is considered not trivial but small project by industry standard. The size is about 150,000 lines of code. And there are about 11 programmers, 10 of whom maintain that code and one fellow writes new code. You understand the complexity? There? And this is nothing. Typical banking software for example would have 3 to 4 million lines of code. The software which controls the space shuttles would have 20 million lines of code. These are unfathomable numbers. It is not possible even for a single individual who is the greatest artist and the greatest programmer to ever be able to write such code. It's not possible. That is why software development is a teamwork and the fundamental problem in any team is coordination and communication. Consider this. You have formed groups, which are three each. Okay. Now you will figure out between today and tomorrow how long it takes to find out two other groups to match with you and work out the details. And now you have a team of three groups. The groups that you would have formed would be obviously based on some kind of a nearness amongst people. Either wingmates or classmates or friends who are on perpetual mobile contact. But what about the other team which is part of your group? Maybe in another hostel? If you have to hold a meeting to discuss some common document, you have to make sure that those three people also come. In order to make sure, you have to make sure that they are informed about it early enough. And you have to make sure that they don't have a football match that evening when you are planning this. It's not easy. And if numbers increase, the communication hazards increase maximum. The standard mathematical formulation for communication cost between n people. How many paths are there between n people? If every individual is required to co communicate with every other individual, the order of magnitude is factorial n. Because each node in that graph will be connected to, it's a complete graph. 
and complete graph has the number of arc, uh, oh, arcs is of the order of factorial n. Now imagine if n is 100, you're dead. You, your pro project will not progress beyond basic communication. Hi, hello, how are you? That's all. You can't do anything else. So if you have 100 people team, and it is not uncommon for very large projects to have 2,000 people teams. 100 people team, 50 people team is very common in the industry. These 50 people cannot work in this free-for-all man. So how do you do? You form hierarchical teams. And within the hierarchical teams, the hierarchy becomes so watertight that if one group of at leaf level node, one individual here has to communicate with another person at the other leaf level node, they have to go all the way up. Any kind of team formation and team control is not very easy at all. This problem was best articulated by a giant in software engineering at a time when software engineering was not the name given to the field. The name is Frederick Brooks. He's a Turing Award winner. He used to work for IBM. He is responsible for architecting the IBM 360 operating system. He made several million dollar mistakes in, in that of, of, of operating system writing because of the goof up of allocation of work to things. But that mistake was realized after the mistake was made and IBM spent a lot of money. But the understanding that the whole world got out of that was phenomenal. He has written a beautiful book, one of the most beautiful books to date on software engineering. It is called The Mythical Man Months. That's the name of the book. Man month or a person month is the unit by which today you routinely measure the cost of software development. But he claimed that the notion of man months is mythical. And he wrote that book. It's a, it is the collection of essays on software engineering. The best book. It was published in 1972. Everything stated in every essay of that book is still valid today. Mythical man months. He is the one who came up with the most popular adage in software industry. When you know a project is getting delayed, as a standard part of project management is, you put more resources and try to bring the project back on rail. He found out statistical evidence was contrary to this faith, and he came up with a line: "Adding people to a late project makes it later." That's the famous line. So if you add people to a late project, Actually, it is delayed further. Rather, if you let just the original set of people do it, they will do it well. That was the million, not million, hundred million dollar mistake made in the OS 360 project by him. Or not by him, but by a senior management. He was the leader actually of a particular team which was advising to the contrary. Beautiful lesson. I think that book should still be available. It is worth reading for each one of you, quite independently as a storybook. Process and project metrics. Metric is measurement number. Remember the basic definition of engineering is your processes must be quantifiable. Quantifiable means you must measure. Okay. You, you, can't, you can't define a recipe in an engineering fashion where you say thoda sa namak dal do. You have to say exactly uh, one fourth teaspoon or whatever, whatever. Things have to be measurable. Because you want to guarantee repeatability of whatever you do. Okay. So earlier we told about that uh, risk Yes, yes. So that doesn't include these metrics? These, there would be, but what? The process and project metrics I'm describing here based on lines of code and function point oriented represent only one specific kind of measurement. The measurement and matrices is a very large topic. The software engineering book will tell you all the kinds of measures and matrices. Here I'm just describing measures which make immediate sense to us. One measure which makes sense to us is lines of code. If a program is 1000 lines long, as opposed to 10 lines long, it ought to be much more difficult to write, etc. The function point oriented analysis works out on certain function points which are allocated to function height. So for each report that the software is required to produce, you classify that report as complex, average or medium or, or, or small. And then say, if this report has so many uh, files to look at, if this report has so many queries to answer, then let's say I allocate 25 function points to it. You look at a screen, you look at query, you look at number of inputs, you look at number of outputs, and arrive that this software requires, say, 
253 function points. Now there is a separate mechanism to convert function points into an estimate of person months. So you say five function points will require one person to work for six months or one person to work for one month, depending upon the technology that you choose, the familiarity those people have with that technology, etc. Software engineering therefore has to do with the estimates of cost and time. And please remember that when you do an effort estimate in terms of person month using any one of these matrices, they, that estimate does not automatically translate into a calendar month by simply aggregating everything. 20 person months does not mean that 20 people working in one month will produce everything. The minimum time required for any project may be 6 calendar months. 20 person months also does not mean that one person will take 20 months to do the entire thing. Person may do it in 12 months. So you have to take this person month with a pinch of salt and translate it methodically for which again there are very good models established based on the statistics of previous exposure etc etc and those models are used effectively in the software engineering now. <coughs> Project scheduling and tracking as I mentioned that is an activity that you need to undertake as part of the project management. In short, the software engineering envisages a quality focus, a process or a well-defined process, any model that you have, the methods that are used and the tools underlying which you will use for doing software engineering. The software engineering, uh, engineering institute model which I mentioned earlier, this is developed by the institute at Carnegie Mellon, just like our school of IT, there is a software engineering institute which is now world famous. This school does not, this institute does not do anything other than software engineering. We had one of their star faculty members visiting us for almost eight months here. We interacted with us and new developments in software engineering models, etc. is the fundamental objective of this institute. This institute many years ago came up with a model called capability maturity model. So what is the maturity of the capability of any group to develop software and deliver software? That is what this thing measures. They have defined five levels of maturity to measure effectiveness of any organization in its software development practices. These levels are called CMM levels. So CMM level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5. There are five levels. You might appreciate the fact that IIT Bombay's team is already considered as at level 1. So we, we have a CMM level 1. As to how good or bad it is, I'll just read out the level 1 model. This is called the initial model. The process is ad hoc. That means nobody knows what anybody is doing during the software development phase. Very few processes are defined. So there is no definition of how this process will be carried out. And success depends entirely on individual efforts. So you will agree that all the software that IITs like you write are CMM level 1 software, 